Our first awardee tonight who is being honored with the Wings World Quest Women of Discovery Humanity Award, Dr. Mandy Halford. Dr. Halford is an associate professor in chemistry at Hunter College and CUNY Graduate Center with scientific appointments at the American Museum of Natural History and Weill Cornell Medicine. Have you ever wondered what is venom? We're fascinated by venom. There's even a Marvel Comics villain named Venom, and I think Venom even battles Spider-Man. In the real world, organisms such as snakes, spiders, and snails use venom to paralyze and kill prey. Dr. Halford is leading the charge to understand the unique peptides in venom and harness them for good. Dr. Halford is combining chemistry and biology to discover, characterize, and deliver novel peptides from venomous marine snails as therapies for human diseases and disorders. Dr. Halford is also inspiring and engaging the next generation with an ed tech company for K through 12 students called Killer Snails, killersnails.com. It's a gaming platform that promotes scientific discovery and learning. Please welcome Dr. Mandy Halford. everyone. I'm going to move the mic over because I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> Snails are powerful, but I am short. <laughs> so, this is, can you still hear me? Yes. All right, perfect. So this is much better. And I want to set my timer so I don't go too long. <laughs> nice to start. Great. So first I wanted to thank, of course, the board, Yale, and everyone that um, honor, is honoring myself and the fellow honorees tonight. I think this is fantastic. I have to say I'm one of the people, when I got the email, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> and I had to Google and search. And, and then also I found out Eleanor Sterling was a former fellow last year from the Museum of Natural History. And so then I was like, all right, this is legit. And I got really excited <laughs> to be among all of the 84 fellows that you mentioned. I went through the list. And it's really, really, really fantastic. And what I love about what you guys are doing with Extraordinary Women in Extreme Discoveries is that you're honoring women who are doing discovery science and who are doing exploration research. And so a lot of times when we talk about women in STEM, we hear a lot about the biomedical achievements, right? From Curie on down to McClintock and all of those women who are doing fantastic work to figure out cellular physiology and all of those things. Rarely do they highlight the, um, the women in the field and the women who are doing exploration and discovery. I mean, there's always a few, a few great ones, Mar Margaret Mead and all of those, but it's a very rare um, thing. So I was very happy that the board picked this area to focus in, whereas things like the biomedical research area is very much more supported. So I thank you again, board members of WINGS, for highlighting a hole in women in science and honoring those women who are doing discovery research. Because I think it's much better to do, to be a racehorse than a unicorn, right? And so what you guys, I think, are doing on the board is trying to identify racehorses, not unicorns. If you saw the movie Hidden Figures, you remember that these women were then celebrated as unicorns in their field, and, and, and they represented the actual women who were doing all this great work with NASA. But I don't think we want to be known as unicorns, right? Because why? Unicorns are mystical, they're rare, they're ma uh, magical, and they're unique. So there's only one spot for one woman doing one great thing? I don't think so. <laughs> we know that there's more than one spot for us, and so we know throughout the history of science that women have been contributing, again, from Curie and even beyond Curie. And so why do we want to be unicorns and have us competing against each other? And even in the next generation, this is my little girl from Nova. I thank you, Eyal, for the onesie. She has some thoughts on the matter. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to be a unicorn. I want to be a racehorse, right? And why do we want to be racehorses? Because we work hard, we're driven, and we're persistent. And of course, we want to win. So we want to compete like everybody else competes. And we want to you know, be our science to shine out the way that everybody else's science will shine out. We were having a discussion last night, a group of us, about hoping that one day we can drop the women in science, you know, so we don't need the qualifier and we can just be scientists. And it's an excellent scientist competition and, and you know, like any other competition, you rise to the best and, and everyone falls in line and to their abilities. 
And so that's sort of where we're hoping to get to. So I like to say that we're race horses and we're all out in the field competing. And yes, we can do science and we do it quite well. And the kind of science that I'm doing in particular takes me around the globe to do a lot of exploration and discovery in the field of venomous research. And so this is me, have passport and will travel. <laughs> These are all of the locations that um, we've, we've done and collected snails. I haven't gone to all of these sites, but through um, museum collections and working with colleagues, primarily at the Paris Museum of Natural History, we've been able to cover the globe and really sort of, we have a unique collection, I shouldn't say unique, I'll say a dynamic collection <laughs> of killer snails that we're studying. And so we make discoveries in nature. So I was very excited because I did my training at Rockefeller University as a peptide chemist. So when I became a postdoc, which is kind of like a um, residencies for doctors, I had to learn something new, and so I had to learn all about taxonomy and evolution. And I went to the Paris Museum of Natural History, and I learned enough so that I could identify species. And the first species I named was after my postdoc advisor um, for having the faith in a chemist <laughs> coming into the lab and doing all of this biology. And so I've made a few discoveries in nature. So now I've named about nine different species of snails. This is the first one. Um, and in our lab, we're also doing discoveries in medicine. In particular, we're figuring out how venomous creatures can be used for drug discovery. So all of these animals are venomous, the snakes, the leech, the, the um, Gila monster, and they've all produced a peptide that a doctor can write you a prescription for today that you can go to the pharmacy and fill, right? So starting with the Gila monster, this guy has produced exenatide, and what's fascinating about Gila monsters is that they're binge eaters. So when they get ready to feed, they release something in their venom that slows their blood sugar and allows them to eat a lot. The drug that they're um, exenatide is being used to cure or treat diabetes, right? So it's something that we've learned from studying the ecology of these animals that we can greatly benefit how we find new medicines for curing disorders and disease that are treating human beings. The other is from the Brazilian vi uh, pig viper, um, captopril, which is an ACE inhibitor for high blood pressure. And my favorite, of course, the cone snail, <laughs> has produced Priog, which is an alternative to morphine. So right now, we know that the opioid ed epidemic is, is ravaging the country. And we are looking for alternatives to pain management that are non-addictive and still as potent. And the snail has shown us Priog. It's the first non-addictive um, <coughs> opioid, or non-addictive, um, non-opioid <coughs> remedy for treating pain. And so we're really, and that was found in the lab where I did my postdoc. So we're really excited about what the discoveries we make in nature can be transformed and transplanted into helping make discoveries in medicine. And so when most people think of venom and venomous animals, right, you think of the snake and it's this agent of fear. But I'm hoping by the end of my talk, you think of them as agents of hope and innovation, especially as the way that we're using them in science, right? And so. Venom has evolved throughout all the different um, tree, branches of the tree of life, and currently we think about 15% of all of the animals on the planet are venomous. I think this is a low estimate because as you know, we don't know all of the animals yet, and the more we learn, the more we will add to this group. So most people recognize the snakes and the scorpions, but we have venomous butterflies, we have venomous um, marsupial, I mean, um, uh, monotremes, and we also have venomous snails, right? And so why is venom so important and why does it show up so much? So the venom that we find in snakes and scorpions and snails are all quite similar. They have similar components. And this is something we call convergent evolution. So what venom has allowed is it's turned a warfare that used to be based on size, the strongest and the biggest always wins. It turned that warfare into a biochemical warfare. So now David could easily beat Goliath and with the magic elixir, <laughs> it's guaranteed that something as slow moving as this nail will also be able to beat Goliath. And when we look at venom, we can it help to, because it's convergent and it's all found throughout all, all um, certain branches of the trees, it helps us to identify the origins of biodiversity. By tracing gene products throughout time, we can see how things have evolved. And that's basically one of the things that venom is very good at doing in terms of natural history discoveries. It's also very good at helping us figure out human things like mapping the brain. So the components that are inside of the venom are very good tools for doing basic macromolecular um, research. So how brain signals communicate 
If I pinch your finger, that's one neuron signaling to another neuron that signals to your brain, ouch, and then you want to get away from me as fast as you can. <laughs> and so what venom does, it, it messes with that signaling process. And so we can then isolate different signals using different venom components to map what is going on in the neuronal circuit. So it's really, really powerful from helping us discover the origins of the earth to figuring out how our bodies work and how our brains evolved. So the power of venom is actually threefold. The first is it's a complex mixture. And I like to describe it as a cluster bomb. It's not one thing. It's not one magical elixir. It's actually made up of anywhere, especially in snails, up to 200 to 500 different individual components in the venom arsenal of these snails. And these components are mostly peptides, which are small protein um, entities. And so the way that they work, they, they conserve their physiological, physiological target over time. So this is one neuron signaling to another, like I told you. And when this arsenal hits you and they inject their venom into you, they basically try to do total destruction on your body. So they fan out and they hit all of these different sort of channels that are able to communicate between um, cells. And they stop things like action potential, which is an electronic signal for how neurons communicate to each other or they stop neurotransmitter release, which is a chemical signal for how neurons communicate to each other. So basically, this venomous cocktail injected into you spreads out through the whole body, and it's finding every pore it can block or every pore that it can activate that will cause you not to move, shut you down, and, in, and enable the, prey to catch, the predator to catch you, right? And so in that sense, it's a successful biochemical innovation because it can help manipulate cellular um, communication. Everything that we do, from breathing to blinking to walking, requires cellular communication. And if you have something like venom that can manipulate that cellular communication, then either you've got a great weapon or a wonderful tool for helping to figure out how our systems work. And so in our lab, we study venom evolution. We use it to identify novel peptides. We then are um, characterizing the molecular function of those peptides, and the long-term goal is to try to discover novel therapeutics, particularly in pain and cancer. And so the snails that we work with don't look like this. This is your garden variety snail. If you're a foodie, you like your snails to look like this, with a little bit of butter. But my snails are like this. They're badass, they're from Brooklyn, they come in leather jackets, they're tattooed. And, and they do this, right? So they feed on different um, organisms. So here, the snail is hidden under the sand. The orange uh, um, thing coming out is like a tongue. Uh, and that siphon is the snows. It, it smells if there's fish in the water. And then what it does, it goes out and harpoons the unsuspecting fish. <laughs> and this is real time. We have not sped it up. And then the snail will come out. Yeah. That's why we call them killer snails. <laughs> so this is amazing, right? So I saw that and I was like, this is what I must work on. <laughs> How is it possible that a snail can, can eat a fish? And so um, when you think of that, the first thing that comes to mind isn't drugs, but it actually can be, and it actually is. And so a lot of the drugs that we have in the medicine cabinet is made up of natural products, starting with extracts from plants. We are also finding extracts from animals. And a lot of what drives the medical field and what drives pharmaceutical production comes from nature. So the more that we learn about nature, or the more that nature is threatened, I should say, the more we lose. But the more that we learn, the more that we gain. And so one area in which my lab is working. We study the phylogenetic history of these snails, which is basically like a family tree of the snails. We try to identify the ones that are slightly unique, doing something special. We look into their venom arsenal, and then from there, we try to identify the individual components that might have activity in, cellular, in manipulating cellular communication. So when you study venomous animals, if you use the whole, <coughs> the whole venom, of course, that is going to kill you. And certain snails are lethal to humans, so we don't want to kill anyone. But if you isolate and find individual peptides that are doing specific things, then you're able to make a cure, right? Then you're able to make something that's a therapy for um, medical treatment. And so venomics is the name of the, the, the strategy that we use to, to identify these compounds. And it's basically a marriage between 
old world, so all of these different organisms that have been around for millions and millions of years, and new worlds, all of the sequencing and geno um, techniques that have recently evolved that allow us to look at genes through molecular studies. And so what we've been able to do is sort of build a roadmap to identify those lineages of snails that have venom and are actively pursuing um, their prey using venom versus those that are not. So it's like the white is where there are no venom apparatus and the black is where there is a venom apparatus. So we follow the black road. And this is, this is great for two reasons. Not only have we identified which lineages have venom, but we also found a way to conserve these organisms. So when we go out in the field, we don't have to collect just like wildly, right? We can go and we can collect those that we know have a venom apparatus and are actively producing venom. And so this helps with conservation of the species and of the, um, the taxa. And in particular, because now we're using genomic methods where before you would have to collect you know, anywhere up to hundreds of a species in order to characterize it properly, now we basically need three, three to five. One, to see what's there. Two, because the grad students always spill something. <laughs> Three, to verify. And then the other two, to really be sure that this is legit what we're finding in, in these animals. So we've greatly reduced what we need to take out of nature in order to study and, and, and learn from nature. So that makes me really happy. And so one area in which we are applying this, as I said, is cancer. And so cancer is, the new thinking about cancer is perhaps if we look at it as a channelopathy as a way to treat it. So the bad thing about cancer is everything on the market right now is just as bad as the disease itself, right? They don't discriminate between healthy cells and tumor cells. And so one way of trying to figure out if we can find things that are specific to tumor cells is to use these venom peptides to plug holes into those channels that are only found or mostly expressed in tumor cells versus those that are expressed in normal cells, right? And so that's why we're thinking of cancer as a channelopathy. And these peptides that we find in the venom will help us to block these holes. And so this is just why this might work is because those channels are involved in these four things. Cell migration, so when a tumor you know, gets bigger and moves on. Cell adhesion, cell cycle control, and then invasion and metastasis. And so what we're applying our venoms to is to figure out if we can stop that tumor cell from growing and metastasizing and stopping that specific signal. So the first peptide we found that does this is TB1. Here we applied it to a bunch of different cancer cells, uh, cervical, neuroblastoma, prostate, and liver. And you'll see in blue is non-treated cells. Green is our peptide from a snail venom, TB1. And, and the salmon color is doxorubicin, which is the drug that's currently on the market for treating cancer. So you see dox will kill all kinds of cancer. It's not specific. Our peptide only seems to be working on liver cancer. So we got really excited about this. When we injected into mice, we found that it significantly reduced the tumor volume. So on the left is with the TV1, on the right is without treatment. So this we know for a fact, we know two things about this peptide. It's, very, it's acting specific to liver cancer and it's not killing um, the um, non-tumorous cells as much. And it also has a very, very potent activity when we inject it into mice in suppressing tumor growth. So this is something we think that the way it's acting is that it's acting on this particular channel, trip channel, which blocks calcium from entering the cells, and then it leads to a bunch of things that reduces, um, inhibits proliferation, apoptosis, and basically angiogenesis, which is how the blood gets to the tumor and helps it to grow. So we're very, very excited about this result, and it's one of the peptides that we've just patented in the lab because we know that we have found something that can stop cancer before it starts to grow and, and get bigger, at least in the lab. <laughs> in the lab, because as you know, what we like to say is we go from mollusks to medicine, and so what that involves is finding a peptide, right, injecting it into all of these, what we call model systems, seeing if any of those are active. When that happens, there's this whole other process then of figuring out how the molecule can go from being active in the bench to being active in humans, right? So there's a lot more testing that has to go on. And so for that, it requires a lot more exploration and discovery, right? And so here is what we're looking at next. These are vampire snails. So on the left, you can see the snail is gonna get into the gill of the fish and basically suck its blood. 
So these guys don't kill the fish. <laughs> they basically feed on the fish to get something good. So what kind of drugs do you think we might get from this? Call it out. You can be loud. <laughs> Anti-clotting drugs, exactly. Anything else? Scream it out. Anesthetics. Anesthetics, exactly, because the fish isn't waking up, right? So there's something that's keeping it numb. It's something that's letting the blood flow. So there's lots of blood thinners, anticoagulants, all of these things that we're potentially exploring to find from these animals. And again, we're doing it in a way where we're, we're, we're quite happy that we're using as few animals from nature as possible, but we're gaining a lot in terms of what we can discover about medicines and, and new remedies. So the next time you look at your medicine cabinet, I want you to see my badass snail <laughs> and understand that we're making lots of discoveries in medicine, but it's only possible because of what we can find in nature. So thank you very much. based on what we've done with pre-alt. So pre-alt was found in 1983, more or less, and it, it became a drug FDA approved in 2004. So it takes anywhere between 15 to 20 years to make a drug, um, and for good reason, right? Because you don't want us injecting things into people ad hoc and folks dropping dead everywhere. <laughs> so it, it'll take about 15 to 20 years to, to get the, the peptide out of the lab onto clinical trials that are successful and then FDA approval. But they're trying to speed that up a little bit because there's a glut in the pipeline. And so there are things that you can do to make that faster. It's similar to what we've done in building that family tree of snails. So if we want to find something that's similar to preol, it helps us to know what snail produced that compound, as opposed to just randomly going to the beach and picking things up and not caring. Um, if we know that it comes from Conus magus, we can look at other species that are closely related to that and help to find other you know, peptides that might do better, more potent, more stronger acting and help speed up that timeline of it. Yeah? What if you, this is kind of a morbid question, but you, say you want to figure out how liver cancer, it reacts to certain peptide. How do you get a mouse to have liver cancer? Oh, <laughs> we inject it with um, tumor cells, basically. So it's subcutaneous and you can see the tumor growing on the skin of the mouse, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Can you, yes. How does the viability of the ocean affect your supply chain? Oh, very important, because these creatures are found in tropical marine environments, and they're living coral reefs. So when we destroy coral reefs, we're destroying their homes, which, which threatens and endangers their lives. So we are always trying to protect where we dive and where we go to collect and make sure that people are aware of the benefits of preserving the oceans because as you'll hear, <laughs> the oceans are sort of our final frontier for knowledge in terms of lots of things. The oceans give us oxygen, they help to sustain us in, in uh, a life on Earth, but they're also giving us what we call blue biotech. They're giving us a lot of um, medicinal remedies for how we're able to treat human diseases and disorders. So if we don't protect the oceans, we lose more than just you know, pretty biodiversity. We lose things that are actually functional as well as um, being exceptional in the fact that they're beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about your ed tech company? Oh, sure. So Killer Snails <laughs> is a company that I started with um, two other friends because at growing up, I did not have a love for science, per se. I tested well. I always did well in science and math classes. And so I went to Brooklyn Tech and all of the, you know, the, one of the specialized high schools in the city. But things were not taught to me as, you, as, as discoveries. They were taught as we know. They were taught as facts, which is still what happens a lot in classrooms. So we know all the elements of the periodic table. We know all the organelles in the cell. And so if you know everything to a child, there's nothing to know, so why should I care about science? And in particular in science, in STEM fields, and what we found is in middle school, girls in particular are dropping out because there's no interest in it, and, and, and boys as well. And so with the company, what we wanted to do is find a way to 
get kids engaged in science using extreme creatures of nature. I mean, who doesn't want to see a snail eat a fish? <laughs> but also using mediums that are uh, attractive to them. So all the kids, whether we like it or not, are on screens. They like video games, they like their iPods, they like you know virtual reality headsets. So what we're doing is creating games, virtual reality games, um, AR games, and tabletop games that tell scientific stories, but through a gaming process. So our first game was called Assassins of the Sea, which we made in collaboration with the American Museum of Natural History. And it won a lot of awards, and it's re doing really well. And our first AR product came out with Google called Killer Snails All Around. And we now have our first BioDive, which is our first real virtual reality product, which is going to be used in middle schools and um, all throughout the country. We're currently testing in 26 states. But it's been really, 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 uh, it's really taken off. We had an article in Forbes recently about the games. And so the idea for me was how do I make science appealing to middle school kids and even maybe younger so that you can understand that you don't have to wait till college or wait till you have a medal or wait till you're you know, so very smart and so very wonderful to do science. We're all born with a curious mind and that's really all you need to do science. And so bringing it to students in a manner that they find palatable and engaging, which is using games, we found seems to be you know, sort of having some resonance. And so we're excited about that and having the company grow. Thank you. <laughs>